Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Rachel Marston. I'm an assistant professor in the English department. Um, and we're so happy that you could enjoy, uh, join us this evening um, for this Literary Arts Institute event featuring the author you of this. Um, I'd like to thank the Manitou Foundation for their long-standing support of the Literary Arts Institute and its programming, and in particular, its support of the Sister Mary Ellen Gable Prize. We'd also like to thank Gray Wolf, whom we partner on this prize, and I'd like to thank Mark Conway, the director of the LAI, who does such great work helping bring amazing authors to campus for us. Um, I'd also like to note that there are books for sale at the back of the room, as well as beautiful broadsides produced by our book art studio. So be mindful that after the reading is over, there'll be an opportunity to have books signed. Sister Mariella Gable's spirit inspires the College of St. Benedict's Literary Arts Institute, which serves the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University and all of its programs. Dante scholar, poet, editor, writer, and champion of new fiction, the late Sister Mariella Gable was an outstanding English professor who taught at the College of St. Benedict from 1928 to 1973. During her career, she fiercely supported contemporary writing that bravely explored new approaches to style, voice, and content. Eula Biss's On Immunity and Inoculation, the recipient of this year's Sister Mariella Gable Prize, fully embodies Sister Mariella's embrace of new ways of telling stories. Biss's On Immunity asks us to think about vaccination both literally and metaphorically. Her lyrical and evocative prose works metaphorically itself, asking readers to engage in a different kind of narrative, one that is recursive and meditative rather than linear. In a roundtable discussion on genre published in the journal Gulf, Gulf Coast, this said that for her, genre is a continuous space. And this exploration and play with genre, form, and content is evident in her work. On Immunity invites us to think about cultural and social fears, as well as our own, surrounding illness, contamination, and invasion. The vampire becomes a key figure, whether through an analysis of Dracula or in the economic theories of Karl Marx. The book also engages with anxieties of motherhood, social responsibility, public health, and so much more. But ultimately, this is a book concerned with connection, how we make connections textually and interpersonally, the ways we are connected, the ways our bodies are connected, the fears we have about acknowledging that connection, and the ways we want to see our bodies as immune, inviolable, autonomous, and separate. In Mrs. essay, Time and Distance Overcome, from her book, Notes from No Man's Land, American essay, she writes, even now, it is impo an impossible idea that we are all connected, all of us. Throughout On Immunity, this reminds us that we are, in other words, continuous to everything here on Earth, including and especially each other. Please join me in welcoming you with us. particularly grateful to St. Benedict for the, the support of this book. It's, it's very meaningful to me to um, have the support of this community in particular. Um, I'm going to start out by, by reading a bit from the beginning of the book. It's just kind of an introduction to what the book is thinking about. And, um, and then I'm going to do something different than what I usually do. Um, but this is just to, this is just to, to orient you. Deep within every man, there lies the dread of being alone in the world, forgotten by God, overlooked among the tremendous household of millions upon millions, Soren Kierkegaard wrote in his journal in 1847. That was the year he finished works of love in which he insists that love is known not through words, but only by its fruits. I read the first 50 pages of works of love in college before giving it up out of exhaustion. 
In those pages, Kierkegaard unfolds the commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, parsing it almost word by word, so that after exploring the nature of love, he asks what is meant by as yourself, and then what is meant by your neighbor, and then what is meant by you shall. Overwhelmed, I stopped reading shortly after Kierkegaard asked, who then is one's neighbor? Which he answered in part with, neighbor is what philosophers would call the other, that by which the selfishness and self-love is to be tested. I'd read enough at that point to be troubled by the idea that one must enact one's beliefs and perhaps even embody them. From somewhere deep in my childhood, I can remember my father explaining with enthusiasm the principle behind the Doppler effect as an ambulance sped past our car. When we watched the sun set over the river where we lived, he described Rylai scattering, the removal of the shorter wavelengths of light by the atmosphere that results in reddish clouds and grass that looks more intensely green at dusk. In the woods, he dissected an owl pellet for me and reassembled from it the tiny skeleton of a mouse. My father marveled at the natural world far more often than he talked about the human body, but blood types were a subject on which he spoke with some passion. People with blood type O negative, he explained, can only receive in transfusion blood that is O negative, but people with O negative blood can give blood to people of any other type. That's why a person with type O negative is known as a universal donor. My father would then reveal that his blood type was O negative, that he himself was a universal donor. He gave blood, my father explained, as often as he was allowed, because blood of his type was always in demand for emergency transfusions. I suspect my father may have already known then what I would only discover later, that my blood too is type O negative. I understood the universal donor more as an ethic than, it is a, than as a medical concept long before I knew my own blood type. But I did not yet think of that ethic as an ingenious filtering of my father's Catholicism through his medical training. I was not raised in the church and I never took communion, so I was not reminded of Jesus offering his blood that we all might live when my father <coughs> spoke of the universal donor. But I believed even then that we owe each other our bodies. Every time my father went out in a boat for my entire childhood, he took a life preserver with his name and organ donor printed hugely on it in permanent ink. It was a joke in which he believed quite sincerely. When he taught me to drive, he gave me this advice from his own father. You're responsible not just for the car you're driving, but also for the car ahead of you and the car behind you. Learning to drive all three cars was daunting and inspired an occasional paralysis that plagues my driving to this day. But when I earned my license, I signed my name under organ donor. The very first decision I made for my son, a decision enacted within moments of his body coming free of mine, was the donation of his umbilical cord blood to a public bank. At 30, I had only donated blood once, back in college when I was reading Kierkegaard. I wanted my son to start his life with a credit to the bank, not the debt I already felt. And this was before I, a universal donor, would become the sole recipient of two units of blood in transfusion after my son's birth, blood of the most precious type drawn from a public bank. If we imagine the action of a vaccine, not just in terms of how it affects a single body, but also in terms of how it affects the collective body of a community, it's fair to think of vaccination as a kind of banking of immunity. Contributions to this bank are donations to those who cannot or will not be protected by their own immunity. This is the principle of herd immunity, and it's through herd immunity that mass vaccination becomes far more effective than individual vaccination. Any given vaccine can fail to produce immunity in an individual, and some vaccines, like the influenza vaccine, are less effective than others. But when enough people are vaccinated with even a relatively ineffective vaccine, 
viruses have trouble moving from host to host and cease to spread, sparing both the unvaccinated and those in whom vaccination has not produced immunity. This is why the chances of contracting measles can be higher for a vaccinated person living in a largely unvaccinated community than they are for an unvaccinated person living in a largely vaccinated community. The unvaccinated person is protected by the bodies around her, bodies through which disease is not circulating. But a vaccinated person surrounded by bodies that host disease is left vulnerable to vaccine failure or fading immunity. We are protected not so much by our own skin, but, what is, by, but by what is beyond it. The boundaries between our bodies begin to dissolve here. Donations of blood and organs move between us, exiting one body and entering another, and so too with immunity, which is a common trust as much as it is a private account. Those of us who draw our, on collective immunity owe our health to our neighbors. And I'm gonna pause there um, before I read the, the next couple sections I wanna read from. This book is written in, in 30 very short sections. And, um, and I always expected that these sections would somehow collapse into a continuous book, but they, they resisted that while I was writing. Um, and there was a point where I had a conversation with my editor from Grey Wolf, Jeff Schatz, who is here tonight. And, um, and we had a long conversation about why the book was structured this way, and um, Jeff was asking really good questions, like will these sections be grouped together as chapters? Should they have titles? Should they have numbers? Um, we hadn't decided yet to treat them the way we treated them in the book, where there's a, there's a, a blank page between uh, sections, and there were a lot of questions up in the air at the time, and, um, and I didn't know the answer to most of Jeff's questions, so we were just muddling around in these questions together. And, um, and I was a little troubled because I had always expected that the book would take some other form, and it, and it wasn't. Um, and then in the course of this conversation, um, there was kind of a, a mutual discovery that we made um, when we were talking about the, the argument that the book is making. And, and one of the central arguments of the book, or the argument that is, that's most important to me, I guess, so central means kind of central in my mind, is the argument that we as humans are both independent and dependent on each other, and that we're, we're bodily independent and we're bodily interdependent, and that our health relies on the people around us, um, and that we, we actually cannot um, maintain our own health without the help of people around us and, and their cooperation. And, um, and I realized in this conversation, actually Jeff and I kind of realized together that these chapters were mirroring the, the argument of the book and that these chapters were individuals. They, they were refusing to be collapsed into one continuous narrative, um, but they were also interdependent. Um, and, and one of the things that later frustrated me is that it was very hard to excerpt from this book. No publisher, no journal wanted to publish one of these segments because they feel very unfinished alone. They, they don't actually feel complete, and, and none of them really are complete. They're, they're all leaning on each other, and the book only makes its argument through accumulation. And, um, and it was really exciting for me to discover in this conversation with Jeff that there was a good reason for the, the form that the book was taking, that it wasn't arbitrary, and, um, and that it made a, a certain kind of sense, and a sense that actually felt deep and, and important to the book. Um, and I was reflecting on uh, this conversation because this is a rare opportunity for me to do a reading with Jeff in the room. And, um, and I don't even actually often get to see Jeff. We've, we've logged a lot of telephone hours, but we don't, we don't get to see each other that often. Um, and I, I reflected on what this, what this collaboration between an editor and a writer is. And, um, and I was thinking about this also because I attended a, a book talk um, in, in Evanston where I live. Uh, there was kind of a book group talk at the local bookstore. And um, they were talking about uh, Harper Lee's new novel, um, Go Set a Watchman. 
and um, and also they were talking about To Kill a Mockingbird, and um, and I just sat in on this out of interest, and um, a lot of people in the room were were very very upset about um, Atticus Finch and the transformation that he seemed to have made between these two books, and um, and that was an interesting confirmation conversation for me to to witness. Um, and it did make me wonder after a while. It, it seemed obvious that people had latched on to Atticus as a symbol of um, kind of white heroism. And it was very upsetting for them to see him in a different context, in a different novel, um, representing something else. And But to, to me, it didn't seem all that hard to imagine that uh, a white person in one context might be anti-racist and in another context might be racist. I think we like to think that people either, it's kind of like being pregnant, right? We like to think that you're either pregnant or you're not, you're either racist or you're not, there's no, not really in between. Um, but I think in, in reality, it's very contextual and, and that people, um, people who um, might be anti-racist in one situation will collaborate with a racist institution in another. Um, and so for, for me, I wasn't bothered by something that seemed to be bothering people in the room quite a bit, which was this revelation that Atticus wasn't who they had thought he was. Um, and this caused, I think this discomfort with the book also caused some attacks on the book, um, which I think to be fair, it, it was, it's not my impression that Harper Lee ever wanted that book to be published. So there, there was to me a little bit of a problem with the book even being out there in the world because uh, she had a good long time in her lifetime to make that book published if she wanted to do that. Um, and it seemed to only happen once she was in very frail health and at the end of her life. Um, and, but the other thing that came up is people didn't like Ghost at a Watchman. Many of the people in the room didn't like it. They hadn't enjoyed it. They didn't like the writing. They didn't like the story. And I was thinking, well, yeah, this is the book that she wrote where she, she was kind of, look, she was figuring stuff out. She was learning. Lots of writers have books they, did, they, didn't, they never publish where they're, they're figuring stuff out and they're learning who their characters are. And then they put it in a closet and they write the book that is the book they want to show the world. So as a writer in the room, I was just listening. But then they latched on to the role of the editor. And they were like, you know what? She needed an editor for this book. If she had an editor, this would be a good book. And if she, you know, and clearly she must have found the right editor for To Kill a Mockingbird. That because, um, because some of them were saying things like, I don't believe this is the same writer. I don't think it's the same person. Um, I don't think she, she, or how could someone who would make all these bad decisions in one book make good decisions in another? And they kept circling around to the mysterious missing figure was the editor. The editor had, had enacted this magic. And I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, you know, an editor does have a huge impact on a book. I'm not totally convinced. Maybe if anyone is capable of it, it's, it's Jeff, of transforming a bad book into a good book. But it, it, in my mind, that's not really the role of the editor is to take, you know, a turd and make it a diamond. Um, but, um, but I do think, it, I thought it might be interesting to, to talk a little bit about what this relationship is and what, what, how a book can change um, because of conversations with an editor. And in my mind, it, the editor-writer relationship is very similar to the teacher-student relationship. And I've actually mirrored a lot of my teaching techniques off of my relationship with Jeff. So I even use some of Jeff's little symbols that he uses in editing. I use them on my student papers. Jeff does something where if something is, is catches his attention, he'll put a little check in the margin. And it's unclear exactly what a check means. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an ambiguous marking. Um, but it's, it, I, I was intrigued by the value of that ambiguous mark. You know, it's, he, He's not exactly um, saying this is, you know, this is terrific, or he's not saying this is a problem. He's saying this caught my attention, and um, and so now I use a lot of checks in, in the margins of my student papers, and I often have students bring the paper to me and say, "What does a check mean? What does this mean?" Um, but the other thing, it, it, the other thing I learned from Jeff that I apply to my teaching is that it's the value of not saying too much, the value of not overloading a student with critique. And I, I feel like Jeff is, is quite, um, 
restrained in his critique. And th th that's always been useful to me as a writer, um, in that it gives me room to solve my own problems. And, um, and in often the solutions seem to come out of nowhere. Um, but there's, there's an important period of time where I kind of, I know there's a problem, but I don't know how to solve it. And I think that, that, um, that the work would be worse off if I was told how to solve my problems. And, and I feel that same way when I'm teaching. I, I try very hard not to tell my students how to solve their problems. I, I try to let them know, I think there's a problem here, but your work as, the, as a writer is to figure out how to solve this problem. Um, so I want to read from some of the sections in this book that wouldn't exist if it weren't for Jeff. So um, one of them, um, actually both of these sections are places where I had most of the manuscript already um, it, intact and Jeff pointed out places where he thought he thought there was a little something missing or he thought there was an idea that needed some bridging. So the way this book is organized is that the chapters are organized so that ideas move um, hopefully a little bit organically. So, so one idea moves into another. And Jeff was pointing out places where he thought it seemed like there was a little bit too wide of a leap. Um, and that was, you know, that's a very open-ended critique, the, the, the critique of something's missing here. Um, and I remember vividly these conversations where Jeff would say, you know, maybe you could write another section right here. And I remember all my excuses for why I could not write another section right there. You know, I don't have time, and you know, I'm starting to feel a little sick even as we talk. And um, you know, no, it, it, basically no. All the things you're suggesting, Jeff, are impossible for many different reasons. And um, and then after the phone call, I would begin to think, well, okay, maybe I'll try. I'll see if something comes out. And, um, and Jeff has a very light touch. Jeff would say, you know, yes, I totally understand. If it's impossible, it's impossible. But think it over, you know? And um, so these are, these are sections that came out of me thinking it over and deciding that, yeah, Jeff was right. Something needs to be here. Um, and part of the, the beauty of this process was that what came out was something that neither Jeff or, nor I anticipated. So especially this section, which um, which I call the cyborg section because um, it, it went um, the way of cyborgs, which was a big surprise for I think both of us. Um, so this is this is one of those sections that came out of that kind of conversation. And just to give you the little background that's filled in by the section before this. Um, I open by talking about a chemical called uh, triclosan, which I discovered last night when I was speaking with um, Dr. Alsterholm that I pronounced this chemical incorrectly, but there's just, is written into my brain this way, so there's no way I'm gonna correct my pronunciation. I say triclosan, doctor says triclosan, so he, 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 he emphasizes a different <laughs> syllable than I do. Anyways, this, this is a very common chemical. You all have it in your bodies because it is in so many consumer products, and it turns out that even people who do not use any products that have triclosan in it have triclosan in their systems and excrete triclosan in their urine because it's ubiquitous in so many products that people use. It's in laundry detergent. It's in um, antibacterial soap is a major source of this chemical. Um, it's in toothpaste, it's in deodorant, it's in a lot of personal care products. Its purpose is to kill bacteria. Um, but it's actually, through a series of studies, it's been found that it is um, not beneficial to, um, to humans for that purpose. And meaning, you can kill bacteria just as well by just washing with ordinary soap. You, you do not need this chemical to kill bacteria on your hands. Um, and that's all the background you need to know before I read this section. Triclosan is destroying our environment and slowly poisoning us all, I determined shortly after I began reading about its toxicity. Or triclosan is harmless to humans and not a serious threat to the environment. Uncertain how to interpret the data, I called the author of one of the studies I had read, an FDA researcher with a kindly voice. I explained my problem, and he said that he would like to help me, but he was not supposed to talk to the press. 
It had not occurred to me that I was the press, though I was writing an article for Harper's Magazine at the time. Frustrated, I hung up the phone and fell asleep with my face on a pile of articles about herd immunity. I woke to find that a fragment of print had been transferred to my cheek. It spelled munity from the Latin munis for service or duty. Munity is what you're really writing about, a colleague would say to me months later. Not immunity. This struck me as true, though I was writing about both. As I rode my bicycle to my son's preschool after failing to determine how good or bad triclosan might be, it began to rain. I ran one block from the school to the public library through the rain, carrying my son, who was laughing. Inside, he darted through the stacks, selecting picture books at random, while the question of whether or not I was the press continued to bother me. I understood it as a broader question of belonging. In my mind, I don't belong to the press even if my writing is published by the press. And if the opposite of the press is a poet, then I'm both. My son returned with a book about a baby alien who gets lost on Earth where nobody speaks her language. A book about a bat who lives with a family of birds who don't hang upside down like she does. And a book about a monkey who's teased for walking on two legs instead of four. The wordplay in Gacky Two Feet was very funny to my son, but he didn't understand the central conflict. <coughs> Why, he wondered, does it bother the other monkeys when Gacky walks on two feet? They feel threatened by his difference, I said. What does threatened mean, he asked. It took me some time to define threatened because I was looking back through the books. Belonging and not belonging is a common theme of children's books, and maybe of childhood itself, but I was surprised that all these books were about the same thing. They were all about the problem of us and them. The bat doesn't really belong with the birds, even though she lives with the birds. And the alien is not at home on Earth. In the end, the bat is reunited, reunited with her bat mother, and the alien is rescued by her alien parents. But some questions remain. How can we be so different and feel so much alike, one of the birds asks the bat. And how can we feel so different and be so much alike, another bird wonders. Bats and birds may be of different biological classes, but they are both as any child can see, flying things. Stella Luna, the book about the bat, allows for some confusion of categories, some disruption of boundaries. But us and them thinking insists on one belonging firmly to one category or another. It doesn't make room for ambiguous identities or outsider insiders. It doesn't allow for bat-bird alliances or resident aliens or monkeys who are in the process of evolving. And so the opposition between us and them becomes, as Wendell Berry warns, the very opposition that threatens to destroy them both. I know you're on my side, an immunologist once remarked to me as we discussed the politics of vaccination. I didn't agree with him, but only because I was uncomfortable with both sides as I had seen them delineated. The debate over vaccination tends to be described with what philosopher of science Donna Haraway would call troubling dualisms. These dualisms pit science against nature, public against private, truth against imagination, self against other, thought against emotion, and man against woman. The metaphor of a war between mothers and doctors is sometimes used for conflicts over vaccination. Depending on who's employing the metaphor, the warring parties may be characterized as ignorant mothers and educated doctors, or intuitive mothers and intellectual doctors, or caring mothers and heartless doctors, or irrational mothers and rational doctors. Sexist stereotypes abound. Rather than imagine a war in which we are ultimately fighting against ourselves, perhaps we can accept a world in which we are all irrational rationalists. We are bound in this world to both nature and technology. We are all cyborgs, hybrids, mosaics, chimeras, as Haraway suggests in her feminist provocation, a cyborg manifesto. She envisions a cyborg world in which people are not afraid of their joint kinship with animals and machines, not afraid of permanently partial identities in contradictory standpoints. All of us who have been vaccinated are cyborgs, 
the cyborg scholar Chris Hables Gray suggests, our bodies have been programmed to respond to disease and modified by technologically altered viruses. As a cyborg and a nursing mother, I join my modified body to a breast pump, a modern mechanism to provide my child with the most primitive food. On my bicycle, I'm part human and part machine, a collaboration that exposes me to injury. Our technology both extends and endangers us. Good or bad, it's part of us, and this is no more unnatural than it is natural. When a friend asked years ago if my son's birth was a natural birth, I was tempted to say that it was an animal birth. While his head was crowning, I was trying to use my own hands to pull apart my flesh and bring him out of my body. Or so I've been told. But I don't remember any intention to tear myself open. All I remember is the urgency of the moment. I was both human and animal then, or I was neither, as I am now. We've never been human, Haraway suggests, and perhaps we've never been modern either. And I'm gonna skip ahead a bit to the next section that, um, that Jeff encouraged me to write. That last section, I realized, thinking about it more as I was reading, I could only have written that when most of the book was already written. There, there were certain questions there that had actually arisen out of writing the book. And one of those questions was, you know, this vaccine debate is, is often presented as a two-sided debate, as you're, you're pro or you're, you're anti. And the more I wrote into this area, the more uncomfortable I, came, I became with that, um, that polarization. And this was the chapter where I got to express that discomfort and talk about the problems that I was seeing with that polarization and how I didn't feel like the solution was, um, you know, sometimes there's some false compromises that are found with vaccination, like, oh, maybe I can just kind of vaccinate or, or use a couple of vaccinations. And that doesn't actually seem to me like a true middle ground. I, I think the middle ground is actually accepting that these things that are being pitted against each other in the debate are not actually uh, things that can't coexist. You know, so for example, science and nature, um, I, I think can absolutely coexist and there's no reason why we need to see them as opposing forces um, or man and woman or um, or even the rational and the irrational. I, I think that those can coexist in the same space. Um, and so this, this was an important thing for me to articulate, if only just for myself um, in this book, but I do think that it, it does what Jeff was asking for in terms of bridging some ideas that were unspoken at the time that he encouraged this section. Um, and then I'm gonna read another section that is, um, I realized just as I was saying that, that I marked the wrong section for you. So now I'm gonna to talk to you as I try to find the right one. Um, this is where titles would have come in handy, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> or numbers or something. <laughs> um, I have to just kind of vaguely remember where, where things are in the book. Okay, I found it. And this section I owe to Jeff and to Maggie Nelson, who both gave me the same advice, and I pushed against both of them in the same way. Um, but they were both suggesting, there was a moment uh, in the book where I was trying to talk about the concept of paternalism, and this came up in the conversation last night with Dr. Osterholm as well. Um, and this is a very troubled area right now in, in medicine, this question of, um, what is paternalism? Is paternal? Is there any paternalistic attitude that is beneficial, or do we have to do we have to strip medicism medicine of its paternalism? Um, and a lot doctors and medical students are having a lot of conversations about paternalism. And I tried initially to write about paternalism in, in the abstract, and um, both Jeff and Maggie encouraged me towards a, a personal narrative as a way of illustrating this idea. And I again had a lot of reasons why that was totally impossible and couldn't be done and I didn't want to do it. And I actually, I actually really didn't want to tell the story that I, I tell in this section for, um, for entirely personal reasons. But now that it's on paper, I do have to admit that it, it is for me the best way of expressing the conundrums that I see in these questions behind paternalism. 
Um, Okay, whenever I complained as a, of a sore throat as a child, my father would press his fingers gently behind my jawbone, checking for swollen lymph nodes. I think you're gonna be okay, he would say upon completing his examination. This was his verdict too when I called him from college, miserably ill with what he identified as probably influenza. I asked him if there was anything I could do and he suggested, to my disappointment, drinking plenty of fluids. Then he recommended his grandmother's prescription for a bad cold, buttered toast dipped in warm milk. He described the way the butter floated on the surface of the milk and how comforting he found his grandmother's care. I wanted to know if there was some sort of medicine I could take. Um, but what I needed, what my father understood, was comfort. As an adult, I still never cease to feel a little surprise when a doctor reaches behind my jawbone to check for swollen nodes. I associate the tenderness of that gesture with my father's care. Paternalism has fallen out of favor in medicine, just as the approach to fathering that depends on absolute authority no longer dominates parenting. But how we should care for other people remains a question. In his discussion of efforts to control childhood obesity, the philosopher Michael Mary defines paternalism as interference with the liberty of another for the purposes of promoting some good or preventing some harm. This type of paternalism, he notes, is reflected in traffic laws, gun control, and environmental regulation. These are limits to liberty, even if they are benevolent. Interfering with the parent parenting of obese children, he argues, is not necessarily benevolent. There's risk in assigning risk. Children who are already stigmatized for their body type are further targeted, and families who are identified as at risk for obesity become at risk to discriminatory, discriminatory oversight. The prevention of risk, Mary observes, is often used to justify a coercive use of power. Autonomy is usually imagined as the alternative to paternalism. But in what, sometimes, what is sometimes called the restaurant model of medicine, the paternalism of doctors has been replaced by the consumerism of patients. We order tests and treatments from a menu based on our consumer research. And the doctor, who was a father in the paternalistic model, is now a waiter. The idea that the customer is always right, imported to medicine, is a dangerous dictum. If you keep telling people that it's just a marketplace and that they're just clients and that the autonomy of the patient is what must be served to make them happy customers, the bioethicist Arthur Kaplan warns, then you have a collapse of professionalism in the face of consumer demand. Doctors may be tempted to give patients what we want, even when it's not good for us. Why does the term paternalism have such bad press in medical circles, asks physician John Lee. Did everyone really have such a hard time with their dad that the reason seems self-evident? He is paternalistic, Lee admits, but as he says, in a good way. A return to paternalism, good or bad, is not the only alternative to consumerism. In a response to Mary's critique of paternalism, the educator Barbara Peterson proposes that we think of the problem of childhood obesity in terms of maternalism. Caretaking, she suggests, is not an inherent threat to liberty. From a feminist caring framework, Peterson writes, liberty is not defined as complete separation and independence from the parent. If fathering still reminds us of oppressive control, mothering might help us imagine relationships based not just on power, but also care. If you're going to get medical care, my father says, you're going to have to trust someone. I've called to ask his advice about a surgery my son's pediatrician has recommended. My father is happy to offer his thoughts, but he's also quick to remind me that he's not a pediatrician. He doesn't want to be the only doctor I'm willing to, tr to trust. He is, in fact, usually the first doctor I consult. When my son woke at dawn one morning with his face so swollen from an allergic reaction that the whites of his eyes were bulging over the irises, I called my father. Did I have to go to the emergency room, I wanted to know, or could I wait until the doctor's office opened in a couple hours? I could wait, my father assured me, and the swelling wasn't dangerous. It's just fluid, he said. 
I now repeat, it's just fluid in my mind every time my son's eyes swell. My son has unusually severe allergies, which he developed at an unusually young age. His pediatrician calls him her outlier because he's a statistical anomaly. By the time he turned three, his, alert, his allergies had led to swelling in his nasal cavity, nasal cavity, and this swelling had led to painful sinus infections, which we had cured with antibiotics several times, but which inevitably returned. After the third round of antibiotics, the pediatrician suggested surgery to remove his adenoids, which had swelled so much that they were completely blocking this nasal passage. Surgery struck me as overkill, and I wasn't eager to have part of my son's lymphatic system removed from his body. When I researched the procedure, I was disturbed to discover that it was performed widely in the early 1900s as a kind of cure-all for childhood ailments. My father was sympathetic to my concerns. He himself no longer has his tonsils because a traveling doctor removed the tonsils of all four children in his family on a single visit. This was, at the time, a standard preventative measure against rheumatic fever, which ceased after research revealed that the dangers of the surgery outweighed its benefits. As a rule, it's wise to be wary of overtreatment, my father told me. But if the alternative to surgery in my son's case was the ongoing use of antibiotics or other drugs, surgery might be the more conservative option. I delayed making a decision for well over six months, all the while trying everything else. A friend suggested an expensive air filter, which I bought. The allergist recommended that I keep our floors clean, a Sisyphean task considering that microscopic allergens were constantly circulating through the air and settling on the floors. But I mopped the invisible dirt, and I changed my son's sheets and pillowcases daily. Despite his protests, I flushed his sinuses with salt water every evening. I gave him a prescription nasal spray. I fed him raw honey and nettle tea. Then his breathing, already loud, became irregular at night. I crouched next to his bed, holding my own breath during the pauses in his breathing to gauge how long he was going without air. After particularly long pauses, he woke gasping and coughing. I scheduled the surgery. The surgeon reminded me on the day of the surgery not to expect dramatic or instantaneous results. She had already been over this with me and had already warned me that my son might continue to get infections despite the surgery. I was most hopeful not that the surgery would enact a miracle, but that it would simply do no harm. It was an easy, routine surgery, she assured me. The most dangerous part was the anesthesia. While we waited in a room full of toy stethoscopes and toy syringes, the anesthesiologist arrived and asked if I had any questions. I told him that I would like to be with my son while he was put under and while he came back to consciousness. The doctor stiffened at this suggestion. Studies had shown, he told me, that the body language and facial expressions of an anxious mother can cause children to fear surgery and resist anesthesia. It seemed there were two ways to interpret these findings, I told him. <laughs> one could determine that the mother's presence is not good for the child, or one could conclude that ensuring the confidence of the mother is essential to the well-being of the child. <laughs> we began to argue in low voices, while my husband and my son applied toy bandages to each other on the other side of the room. The implication that I was a hysterical woman and a threat to my child was making me so angry that it seemed possible I might actually become hysterical. Finally, we compromised. I would be allowed to hold my son's hand while he was put under anesthesia if I agreed to position myself so that he could not see my face. In the operating room, I talked to my son from beyond his range of vision until the anesthesia took effect. Watching the muscle tone leave his face and body was disturbing, like seeing a rehearsal of death and I was eager to go back to the waiting room as soon as he was unconscious. But the anesthesiologist called after me. Don't you want to give him a kiss? He asked, to my disgust. A smiley faced balloon bobbed mutely against the ceiling of the waiting room. It had been trailing us ever since my husband untied it from the stuffed pig that was given to my son by the child life specialist, who assured me that the pig could accompany my son into surgery. All the doctors were very pleased about this, even the stern surgeon. 
They seemed convinced that the pig would be a source of great comfort to my son. <laughs> perhaps as a punishment intended for me, or perhaps as the result of an error, or just a matter of, matter of routine, my son woke from anesthesia before I was summoned to the recovery room. I could hear him screaming, Mama, where's my mama? all the way down the hallway. I knew from my own experience with surgery that the moment before anesthesia takes effect and the moment after it loses its effect can seem to be the same moment. In my son's mind, I had vanished. When I reached him, I was, he was thrashing in confused panic, trying to rip the IV line out of his body. I climbed up on the gurney to hold him and stroke his hair and keep his hands away from his IV while he wailed. He won't remember any of this, the anesthesiologist assured me nervously. I was busy calming my son, but I looked up just long enough to say, I will. My father suggests that the time has come for another version of Dracula, in which the vampire serves as a metaphor for medicine. Because, he says, medicine sucks the blood out of people in a lot of ways. The cost of my son's surgery, which was considerably more than the cost of his birth, would have made it an impossible decision for many families. I was reminded of this in the days immediately after the surgery, when my son's breathing became easy and quiet. He slept better, he put on weight, and he stopped getting sinus infections. I now regret waiting to give him the surgery, but my husband does not. It was responsible of us, he says, to be skeptical. Either despite or because of his training, my father is himself fairly skeptical of medicine. He once joked about the two-sentence textbook he would like to write for physicians. Most problems will get better if left alone. Those problems that do not get better if left alone are likely to kill the patient no matter what you do. <laughs> He's an oncologist. <laughs> this is as much an argument for preventative medicine as it is a sigh of defeat. I remain grateful for my son's surgery, just as I remain furious with the anesthesiologist and dismayed with myself for trusting my child to someone I did not myself trust. Where there is trust, paternalism is unnecessary, the philosopher Mark Sagoff writes. Where there is no trust, it's unconscionable. And so we're caught in a double mind. I'm gonna stop there. Either if you want to do something else, we can do something else. All right, let's do something else then. Thank you.